Um, good morning, everyone. It's a real honor and a privilege to be here with so many uh, inspiring uh, leaders and uh, speakers. I'm going to spend just a very short while telling you a little bit about what we do in Infant. Uh, not so much the what, but more about the why. So how I spend my day job and frequently my nights is depicted on this slide. Um, I'm an obstetrician. I specialize in the management of high-risk pregnancies. Um, and fortunately for me, that means I often get to deliver them. Uh, often during the night as well as during the days. But as an academic and as a researcher, I also carry the admin workload and the, the research. I, I run a research, a very busy, successful research group at University College Cork. So it's a very, it's a very mixed and very varied day. Um, but what really motivates me is the picture of the healthy baby on the top left-hand side of that screen. I often say that I work in a happiness factory. Most days, and certainly every single week, I get to be a part of what is the most special day of any person's life. It blitzes your marriage, it blitzes your PhD conferring. Nothing is as special as the day you give birth to your baby. And I get to be a very small part of that, which is a privilege, and it is like working in a happiness factory. But unfortunately, not infrequently, that doesn't happen in quite that way. And it is a, a very unfortunate reality that during 2015, the world will witness the death of another 300,000 pregnant women. Now, by definition, these women are young, they're pregnant. And by definition, they have to be at least halfway healthy to get pregnant in the first place. But the real tragedy for me as an obstetrician, as a woman, as a mother, and as a researcher, is that these girls aren't dying of strange or exotic or complicated diseases that are new and are catching us by surprise. They're actually dying of diseases and conditions that were recognized by Hippocrates and are depicted on the walls of the giant pyramids in hieroglyphics. Let's take another example. Back in 1981, when I sat at the 11 plus and was thinking about what I would do at high school, a strange new condition was first described in the medical literature um, a condition that seemed to affect gay men predominantly on the uh, western seaboard. Within three years, that condition had been identified, the virus had been isolated, it had been sequenced. And by the time I actually went to medical school, drugs had been repurposed, refashioned, and treatment had been commenced. And by the time I graduated, death rates and mortality from AIDS had fallen exponentially. And now, in resource-appropriate settings, with access to correct diagnosis and correct treatment, um, the prognosis in AIDS is excellent. It's gone from days and weeks at diagnosis to decades. And yet the same can't be said of um, pregnancy-related conditions. In Ireland, maternal death is fortunately very rare, but we still um, cope every day with the significant morbidity and mortality associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. Globally, 300,000 women die every year. That's the tip of the iceberg. For every woman that dies, a family is often orphaned. If your mother dies in sub-Saharan Africa before you reach the age of two, you only have a 25% chance of living to the age of five. So maternal mortality is a tragedy that goes on giving. I'm going to talk very briefly about um, one particular condition that's very close to my heart. So preeclampsia is a condition that affects uh, only 3% of pregnancies, but it accounts for a third of all maternal deaths. Um, it accounts in this coming year will kill somewhere in the region of 72 to 100,000 women, largely in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a condition, like all the other pregnancy conditions I deal with, that's been around for many, many uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And one of the reasons why we've made so little progress in the treatment and the understanding and the curing of preeclampsia is because R&D investment in perinatal research remains very small and non-strategic. The number of registered pipeline drugs for perinatal conditions such as preeclampsia is only about 1% to 5% for comparable conditions like stroke, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Now, there are many reasons underlying that, and now's not the time to go into the long legacy that thalidomide has cast on perinatal research and the other complexities, the ethical challenges, and the logistical difficulties with conducting research and trials in pregnancy and newborns. But the truth is that equitable R&D investment and public sector funding in just, for just a decade could actually um, avert that disease burden. 10% of the global disease burden is caused by perinatal disease. That actually dwarfs cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke. 
And if we had equitable investment, we could avert 3% of that disease burden within just one, one decade. In infant, we're trying to address that. So back in 2012, my co-director, friend and colleague, Geraldine Boylan and I were fortunate enough to be funded by Science Foundation Ireland to establish infant. Infant's based here at Cork University Maternity Hospital. We're on the top floor of one of Ireland's busiest maternity units, and that's strategically incredibly important to us because we can access the 9,000 women that come through our doors every year to deliver their babies. Um, Infant is a diverse, growing exponentially group of researchers from a huge array of backgrounds that encompasses everything from computer scientists, electrical engineers, all the way through to bench scientists and epidemiologists. And I can talk briefly in a minute why that diverse array of expertise and skill sets are very important to us. We have a very uh, high quality lab on the fifth floor, but we like to think of our entire hospital as being our laboratory. We research at the cot side and at the bedside, in the NICU and in the intensive care unit where the most vulnerable and sick mothers and babies uh, are cared for by our staff. We have um, ongoing projects in a variety of things, including med medical devices, biomarker discovery, connected health. Uh, we are particularly strong in neonatal brain research, and we're now starting to conduct international perinatal clinical trials of diagnostics and devices. Our mission is to use our Irish innovation to deliver scientific excellence, uh, which will deliver uh, societal and economic impact. It's what Mark Ferguson, the, the Director General of uh, Science Foundation Allen, likes to call delivering a double bottom line. We have societal impact, and I think that's obvious, but um, we are also making economic impact, not just with healthcare savings, but also by delivering innovations to a huge vacuum, an area of clinical pent-up need. So, briefly, preeclampsia. It kills about 70,000 women a year, it accounts for about half a million neonatal deaths. It accounts for um, a fifth of all neonatal intensive care admissions. So if you go around any intensive care unit, neonatal intensive care unit in Ireland right now, somewhere between 20 and 25% of the babies are there just because of this condition, because they've been born early or small or both. And the cost is almost incalculable. Many people have tried to do a health economic exercise to actually calculate the true cost of preeclampsia. It's almost impossible. But we think it's somewhere in the region of 45 billion US dollars in direct healthcare costs each, annum, each year. And that does not take into account the ongoing costs of caring for the baby. This is a picture by Jan Stern. He was a pupil of Rembrandt, and it was painted in about 1732 or 1733. It depicts a heavily pregnant woman I think you can see the gravid uterus in the picture. Uh, she has a headache, her, head's, uh, her head is very sore and her eyes are rolling back in her head and she's clutching her chest. These are the classic symptoms that I teach my medical students every day to be aware of for preeclampsia. It causes headaches and it causes, uh, in its severe form, liver pain, which exacerbates chest pain here. You can see, if you're very careful, the urine pot at the far right-hand corner of the, um, the screen. Physicians back then didn't know that the kidneys were leaky in preeclampsia and that protein would appear in the urine, but they did know that if you poured it from a great height, the urine would froth, and that was a diagnostic sign of preeclampsia. And you can see the midwife coming in with the urine to pour it back into the chamber pot just here. I'd like to tell you that my antenatal clinic, which I was doing yesterday, is different to this. The surroundings are slightly more salubrious, but in fact, how we manage the patients hasn't changed at all. We still ask for signs and symptoms, and we, we don't have to pour the urine from a great height anymore, but all we do now is just dip it for protein. Nothing much has changed in nearly 400 years. There is no effective screening test for preeclampsia. Our diagnosis is based on decades-old technology, and that means there is no effective treatment, and crucially, no effective prevention. I'm going to tell you very briefly, in the few minutes I have left, about two things that we're doing in infant to try and change this. We are trying to develop an effective screening test. If I can tell at the start of a pregnancy which one of the 100 women that walk through the door in any given day, which three of them are going to get a severe preeclampsia, we can look after them differently. We can channel our limited resources into uh, intense maternal and fetal surveillance instead of what we actually do at the moment, which is just see everybody as frequently as we can afford, and that's not very frequently. And we'd also like to improve the diagnosis. We'd like to make the diagnosis more patient-centered, more mother-friendly. 
We've been using metabolomics. Metabolomics is one of the uh, omic families. It's the new kid on the block. The metabolome is downstream from the genome and the proteome. The metabolome is the um, breakdown, the, the, end, um, the end result of cellular metabolism. Metabolites appear in the bloodstream within an hour of, for example, eating a ham sandwich. So it's very dynamic. It's very uh, responsive. It tells us exactly what's going on. I love this quote from Bill Lasley, genomics and proteomics tell you, tell you what can happen, whereas metabolomics tells you actually what has happened. We've been mining the metabolome for um, 12 years now for biomarkers of preeclampsia, and we've been using technology that's more commonly seen in CSI Miami. We've been using mass spec-based technology borrowed from the forensic lab. We've also been fortunate in um, being able to access one of the world's largest and most well-phenotyped pregnancy biobanks. Through the funding from the Health Research Board, we've actually managed to accumulate a huge amount of samples from over 5,000 low-risk first-time pregnant mums. And that's been crucial to our endeavor to discover and validate biomarkers. Mums uh, come through our hospital at 15 weeks. They revisit several times and give detailed information, 2,400 data points per person, and a huge amount of samples. And using this biobank, we've actually discovered um, significant biomarkers for the later development of preeclampsia. We published this paper a few years ago, but even the, the non-bench scientists can see that the yellow squares are very different to the blue dots. And this actually is, being, is using metabolomic biomarkers to actually tease apart women who are subsequently at risk of preeclampsia from healthy pregnant women at 15 weeks gestation. This, if we manage to market it successfully, be, will be the world's first early pregnancy screening test. We've had to mine for 14 metabolites because it's a complex disease. It's, very, um, um, it's, very, it's a multi-system disease and very heterogeneous. But we've now got a detection rate of over 90%. And we're currently trialing this in a phase 2A clinical trial funded by FP7 throughout Europe. That's cutting edge research. Meanwhile, back in the clinic, one of the ways we diagnose preeclampsia is by using um, blood pressure measurements. Every single uh, time a woman needs an antenatal check, she has to travel to either her GP or the hospital to have her blood pressure taken. And routine antenatal care means that women do that on a, as a minimum 12 times during their pregnancy. Hospital-based monitoring or even GP-based monitoring is time-consuming, it's disruptive, and it's expensive. And our patients hate it. Many of my mothers are working mothers. If they need to come to the hospital in Cork, which is often 50, 60, or 70 miles away from where they live, that's a whole day. It costs 15 euro to park. They, by the time they wait for three hours in the antenatal clinic, their blood pressure is sky high. And so it's a false diagnosis. We frequently admit women to hospital with false diagnoses of query high blood pressure, only for it to settle the next day. But crucially, in resource, low resource settings, like in some areas of Africa where I've worked, the rate limiting step here is actually access to a healthcare provider who can accurately measure the blood pressure. And this struck us as being completely bonkers in the 21st century, because now home blood pressure monitoring is actually widely available. You can walk out the door and go into the very first boots and buy a very cheap monitor off the shelf to monitor your blood pressure. So why hasn't this been used for patients' advantage in pregnancy? Well, for a while, there were no validated monitors, but there are now. There are cheap, robust, easy-to-use, validated monitors available that are accurate in pregnancy. And we have been trying to set up a system called LANIV, which is Irish for baby, but in our, in our center stands for learning to evaluate and manage antenatal blood pressure at home. We know that pregnant women are young, they're highly motivated, and they're early adopters of innovation. Most of my patients map their pregnancy with apps. As they sit in the waiting room, they're looking at apps to tell them how far along their pregnancy is and to visualize what their baby looks like. Pregnancy is a teachable moment. Women are more, more likely to engage in a dialogue about their health in pregnancy than at no other time. And so using this very motivated, young, techie um, population is a very good way of actually developing a platform for home blood pressure monitoring that once it works and is validated, could actually be then transposed to a more vulnerable group, such as an elderly population who may need to monitor another paradigm of their health in the home. Working with IBM, we're currently designing, developing, and validating a framework which will communicate home blood pressure readings and associated other associated clinical risk factors to relevant healthcare providers. 
This is a fantastic innovation. It means that instead of coming into the hospital 12 times during the antenatal period, a woman can actually monitor her blood pressure at home, where it's much more likely to be accurate because she'll be relaxed and in her home environment. It will be transmitted via the cloud to my desk, and it means that instead of actually seeing and measuring 100 people's blood pressure, which will take most of the morning, I can actually just look at a display on my desktop and take about half an hour to go through all the blood pressure results. It's much more meaningful uh, use of my time, it's much more economic, but above all, it's patient-focused and it's much more uh, appropriate for a busy mum. So this is a, that's just a very short overview of what we do in infant. Um, we're hopefully moving to a time when actually we'll empower women to monitor and manage their pregnancies through apps and using small mobile devices as depicted in this picture here. But what we're really about is making sure that that happy day I talked about right at the beginning is a really happy day for everybody and not just those in resource-appropriate settings. Thank you very much.